All right. Hello. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> so Tracy, we have a, a pretty full room here. I'd say we're getting close to full in the Piazzoni murals room at the De Young, and you're in London. What time is it there? Uh, it's about five past five. Okay, it's just about uh, a little after 10 a.m. here, and it's right. rainy today in San Francisco, and I was wondering what the weather's like in London today. Is it... Well, it's it's freezing. It's winter, um, and everybody uh, we're we're obsessed with weather here, and yes. as English people are always too. are. And um, uh, there's some uh, the wind is supposed to be coming from the west, and it's coming from the east, from Siberia, and they say it's going to be like that till the middle of April. So it's going to be freezing. So we're okay. <laughs> well, hello we to you. everybody in the room there. By the way, I can't see you. I can only see <laughs> Melissa. But thanks for coming. I think we're we're both dressed appropriately for the late spring weather today with our turtlenecks. Yeah. So Tracy, I'm going to tell you a little bit about yourself as an introduction to our audience. <laughs> Sorry, the, pre the requisite uh, introduction. So Tracy Chevalier, if you didn't know, you are a New York Times best-selling author. You are also celebrated for your richly imagined and beautifully crafted novels centered around captivating historical figures like Johannes Vermeer, the Dutch painter featured in your blockbuster novel, Girl with a Pearl Earring. So you were born and raised in Washington, D.C., and you now live in London with your husband and son. You have a BA in English from Oberlin College and an MA in Creative Writing from the University of East Anglia in England. Right. You've written seven novels, and today we're going to focus on your second novel, Girl with a Pearl Earring, which won the Barnes & Noble Discover Award, sold four million copies worldwide, was translated into 39 languages, and was made into an Oscar-nominated film starring Colin Firth and Scarlett Johansson. Whew. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so for the 0.0001% of people who just happened to find us on Google Hangout or wandered into the De Young Museum this morning and have no idea what your novel is about, could you just give us a couple sentence summary of what you would find if you opened the pages of Girl with a Pearl Earring? Well, if you've ever wondered about the story behind the, I have the painting back there. It's not the real thing. Obviously, you have it. Um, <laughs> no, we have her here at the young. <laughs> that's the poster I've had since I was 19. Um, and uh, the book is about the girl in the painting um, who I've decided uh, is uh, a servant, goes to work for Johannes Vermeer, um, cleans his studio, and ends up getting drawn into helping him uh, with his painting process and uh, because they have a kind of aesthetic meeting of the minds and in amongst this chaotic household um, they find this kind of tranquility in his studio and um, he ends up painting her and wearing her his wife's earrings and the wife finds out sees the painting at the end and it's about the build up to painting it and um, the 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 uh, effect that this relationship, this developing aesthetic relationship, has on the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. So for me, seeing the Girl with the Pearl Earring by Vermeer here in San Francisco was actually the first opportunity that I ever had to see the painting. She normally oh. lives in The Hague at the Maritz House Museum, and yeah. I'd never seen her before. Of course, I'm familiar, as I think most people are, with her image, but I'd yeah. never seen her in person. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the first time that you saw her in person. Yeah. Do you remember where um, that was? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, I was 19 and I was visiting my sister in Boston on spring break and uh, she, I walked into her apartment and um, on the wall was that poster, an, another poster just like that. Um, ah. And uh, she had just bought it at the Harvard Coop, this bookstore uh -huh. in Harvard Square and I just absolutely fell in love with it. I thought it was the most beautiful painting I'd ever seen. The colors, the light on her face, the, the strange expression on her face that you can't quite pin down. I was just blown away by it. And um, the next day I went out and bought a, paint, a, a poster for myself. And ever since I've had it hanging um, wherever I've lived uh, from... So that's the poster that inspired you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. So uh, even when the there have been newer reproductions made of the painting, and particularly when in 1995 there was an exhibition of Vermeer, uh, first in Washington D.C. and then in The Hague, and 
they they cleaned up the painting um, for that particular exhibition, and they uncovered all kinds of things. Like there's a little uh, there's a little a uh, fleck of um, pink at the corner of her mouth, um, right. and my old reproduction doesn't have it because they only uncovered it when they cleaned the painting. And, and that little very... extra spot yeah. of white on her pearl too, which yeah. you can tell. Yeah. Exactly, and and in fact, I bought a newer reproduction of it. But after about a week, I took it down and put back the old one because uh, um, I'm just used to it. I mean, it's incredibly faded over time with sunlight on it, and uh, but but I'm used to it. It's got history for me. So so any yes, and um, so that was the how I first saw the painting. And um, but I didn't at the time think, oh, I'm going to write about her. That only came about 15 years later. Hmm. So I was, I was, um, I had this up hanging wherever I went back at, at Oberlin in my dorm room and wherever I, you know, when I came over to England, I brought the poster with me When I went back to the States. I took the poster back and back and forth. And, and then, so it's, it's always been with me. That's great. And what about when you got to see the actual painting for the first time? Where was that? That was in 1996. This exhibition I mentioned um, was uh, came over to The Hague, and by that time I was living in London, and um, my my husband and I went over for the weekend to, to the exhibition, and there were 23 Vermeers there, and by that time I was, I became this kind of Vermeer fanatic, not fanatic mm -hmm. exactly, but one of my life's goals was to see all 36 Vermeers in the flesh. And uh, and I was able to take off twenty three of them in one go in this at this exhibition. Wow. And one of them, yeah, it was great. And one of them was Girl with a Pearl Earring. Um, uh, and it was great. Well, actually, it wasn't great seeing it because it was it was a crowded the exhibition. Was a victim of its own success. It was yeah. so crowded that you could only see her over several heads. Or you know, if you're walking past, you you get your three seconds in front of the painting and then you get shoved out of the way. I have no idea if that's how it is at De Young now with her. No, we've installed her in her own gallery. So she actually has a big frame around her. She has her own space in this full room. And I've heard from people visiting the exhibition that they just feel like that was the appropriate way to give her this breadth of space so that everyone feels like they have their moment in front of her, which is really important because she's such a famous yeah. image. We all want to have that um, experience standing in front of her, I think. But does she, um, uh, is it a very crowded, are a lot of people going to the exhibition? So the do exhibition you feel is like very popular. You don't get a whole lot of time on your own in front of the painting. You I think it's been nice to watch people actually as a, as a go in as an anonymous person, not as the curator working on the exhibition yeah. and watching people take their time to move past each other and I think there's a sense of reverence when you stand in front of her yeah. and yeah. she's so familiar to us and we all maybe have our own subjective mm. stories that we put on her. I think a lot of people are aware of the story that you've given her. I wanted to ask you about this anecdote that I heard from the collections manager at the Moritz house. Have you heard this story that after your novel was published and probably after the film came out, people started going to the Moritz house saying, I'm here to see the painting of Greet. Where's the portrait of Greet? And the Moritz house just went into a tizzy because they thought, what is the portrait of Greet? We don't have a portrait, a painting called the portrait of Greet. And then all of a sudden they realized that your book and the story that you created, which is so yeah. such a beautiful way to fill in the mystery about her, had actually become a part of the fabric of understanding the painting. So what does that feel like <laughs> for you it, to have this, this uh, association forever with one of the world's most famous paintings? You know, on the one hand, it's absolutely wonderful, and I couldn't ask for a nicer painting to be able to um, follow around and still talk about, and and not just not just her, but also all of Vermeer's paintings. I I just love his work, and I even after all this time, I mean, the book came out in 1999 in England and 2000 in the states, and so it's been 13 years, but mm -hmm. I'm still happy to talk about the painting and about Vermeer. Um, so I feel very lucky in that way. But if I had had any idea that this would have, that this was going to be such a huge, um, well, that people would take it as given that this is the real story of what happened, I probably never would have written it. I would have been too terrified. I would have felt the responsibility. <laughs> and But, you know, when I wrote this, I, I wasn't known at all. 
um, I kind of worked in this wonderful bubble of uh, you know creativity, and I could just do whatever I wanted, and um, <laughs> Because I thought that the book was going to sell like 500 copies to my family and friends and a few onlookers, and then it would sink like a stone, and and that would be that. Um, but that's not what happened. And and I too have heard these stories of a friend. There was a, a Vermeer exhibition later after that first one. There was one in 2001, I think, at the Met in New York, and then it came over to London. And a friend of mine went to the Met one and said that he was walking around and he was behind people who were saying. Oh yeah, that's the other maid, and that's the oh, there's the patron Van Riven, and there's the girl in the red dress, and it was sort of um, they they really just felt like it was real, and and that is quite a responsibility. Um, but for the most part, I I I'm glad. I feel like people have responded well to it, and I mean I've got a lot of I've had a lot of letters and email from people saying thank you because I look at paintings differently now and mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you what how wonderful it is to hear that for for any novelist you know usually I just I write to entertain mostly and and if a little bit of education comes in on the side that's great but it's that's not the primary purpose and so it's really wonderful to know that the, the book is having a much wider effect um, on how people look at art it's really fabulous I think it's such a nice resonance for that you have this painting created almost 250 years ago that inspires you to write a book that's published in 1999 which becomes a film in 2003 and I read somewhere that you likened the book and the film to sisters that you were saying that they're not they're not the same thing they're just different they're related but they have this nice relationship and I think that's something that's lovely to think about so let's talk about a little bit this okay. book that you've written and mm -hmm. we sometimes call Vermeer the Sphinx of Delft we don't know a lot about him so how did you start to create this story we know that the painting inspired you but how did you start to create the character of Vermeer when we really know so little about him well what happened with how I came up with the idea um, I was lying in bed one day, it's like 15 years after I had the poster, um, and I just looked up at it and I thought, I wonder what Vermeer did to her to make her look like that. Mm. And it was the first time that I actually thought of, um, of the expression on her face as being anything other than a portrait of her. It was more like a portrait of, of the relationship. And um, and that made me think, well, what I wonder what the relationship was. And so I started looking into Vermeer, reading more about him and, and about this particular painting, and I discovered that they have no idea who she was. They have no idea who any of the models in his paintings were, which meant that the, the field was open to me. I could write whatever I wanted. Um, and so the way I came up with it, uh, you know, I read everything I could about Vermeer, but the great thing for me is that his story is very patchy. Hmm. All we know is he was in Delft, um, he trained as a painter, he married Katerina, who was Catholic, he was Protestant, he probably converted in order to marry her. They had 11 children. Um, he, they lived in his mother-in-law's house. He painted in this one particular room on the first floor with north-facing light. And um, he had this patron, Van Riven, who ended up with a lot of his paintings. And that's really all we know. He hardly traveled. He died at age 43, um, probably of stress related. He was in debt. And uh, he, he either had a heart attack or had a stroke. So that's pretty... And then we have the paintings. And that's pretty much all we know. Um, and uh, I thought, as I looked at the painting, I thought, I wonder, uh, I feel like the look on her face is so intense and, um, and, and intimate that mm -hmm. I, I felt that he and she must know each other. Right. So she's not just anybody. You know, the, the, a lot of art historians think that she's his eldest daughter, but his right. eldest daughter at that time would have been 12. And I think, I think she looks a little older than that. Mm -hmm. And also, Dutch painting at the time, if you have your mouth open like that, glistening mouth, it's kind of meant to be a sexual availability. And I thought, he's not going to paint his daughter like that. So yeah. it's not his daughter, but it's someone close to him. So who could be close to him? Well, neighbor... I know somebody who's actually physically near him would be a servant, and uh, so that that gets her into the house. So she's a servant, and then I thought, well, what uh, what would her relationship with him be like? Her relationship to me seemed very ambivalent. Is she happy or sad? 
innocent or experienced, it's very difficult to tell when you look at the painting. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of conflicting, contradictory elements. And and uh, I thought, okay, um, uh, she's his servant, and he wants to paint her. So how does he get to know her? Well, she must be in his studios at some point. And the the very few things we know about Vermeer is that um, he had eleven children, which would have been a big chaotic household. Right. And yet, you compare that to his paintings are quiet, contemplative, usually one person, woman, often in one corner of a room with the light coming down from the left. And how do you paint something so calm with all these kids around? Well, you have to compartmentalize. That was the big leap I took. I thought, he, you know, he has this studio and he said, nobody comes in here, not the wife, not the kids. Okay, the, the, the servant can come in to clean, but that's it. Mm -hmm. So that gets her in to the to the um, to the studio, and uh, we also know that he spent a lot of well, we don't know this, but we're guessing from the uh, brushwork that he spent a lot of time on each painting. Mm. It would have taken a couple of months to, at least to do this painting. Um, so she's in there. If he decides to paint her, he's going to be with her on her own for a long time. Mm -hmm. We also know um, that uh, his wife's clothes were used, were worn by several different models. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an attachment to the will, which we still have from the archives. Vermeer's will is an attachment. He was in debt, and so they did a. Uh, the creditors came in, the executor came in, and 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 cataloged the whole house. What was in an inventory of everything in each room, which included a list of his wife's clothes, a yellow. Um, house coat, a yellow and black bodice, a blue house coat. And these things we know are Katerina's, but they were worn by clearly different women in these diff in different paintings. So we know there was a history, a tradition of, of her clothes being lent out for the models to wear. So when I look at the painting, if I think the, the servant, she's a servant, she's wearing very simple clothes, and yet she's wearing a pearl earring that couldn't possibly be hers because she wouldn't be able to afford it. Right. So whose pearl earring was it? It was probably his wife's. Um, and that, all those little elements were, so so if his wife, if he, she's wearing it, um, and it's this beautiful painting at the end, he spent all this time alone with her, what's the wife gonna think when she sees this painting? So I kind of lay in bed and just thought up this whole story in like three days because all of the elements were there and, and, and they're, they're in the painting and in his biography. But given how little we know, I was able to actually create quite a, 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 a rich story out of it. Well, I think one of the things that's so lovely about your story is that it has this perfect resonance with the way you're talking about the stillness and the calm in Vermeer's paintings. And I've read a little bit about what you've said about trying to make the book feel like Vermeer's paintings in that way using very um, clean sentences and even naming the character Greet, which is very contained. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the meaning behind her name and if, the, if that has any special import. Well, I was so ignorant. Um, this is one <laughs> of those amazing things that makes you think, wow, I really was on the right track and it was through ignorance. But um, the way I choose names for my characters is often um, I'll start doing research on whatever the topic is and what in the period, and I, I keep in the back of my notebook a names list. And for this, I was reading all this stuff about Vermeer and Dutch society and all that, and I kept a names list in the back of the notebook, and I wrote down various names, and and I came across Greet, and I thought I want to use that because there's just something about her. She's very self-contained. I wanted a short name that was, but it was short for something slightly longer that's a very beautiful name, Marguerite. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, so I thought, great, it just sounded right. I named her that all well and good. So a year after the book comes out, so a reader points out to me, you know, really clever that you used Mar you know, Greet. And I was like, uh, thank you. And they said, because, you know, of course you know Marguerite. Uh, means, comes from the Greek for Margareta, means pearl. <laughs> and I just amazing. thought, oh. Yeah, it was amazing. I don't know if you can hear the audience laughing with yeah. just 
joy over that amazing yeah. coincidence. That's wonderful. Well, there was another name coincidence that was as every bit as surprising to me. Um, when I was doing this, keeping a list of names, I wrote down among other names the the name Annika. And um, then I was reading a, a, a biography about Vermeer's. I mean, there's so little known about Vermeer that it's hard to have a biography just about him. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a biography about everybody around him. Right. And, uh, and they based it a lot on um, legal documents that they found if he ever had to go to court because he's in debt or if some, you know, all sorts of things like that. So um, I was reading about this and they named, it said it when he had another um, servant in his household. You know the, the Vermeer painting of the woman pouring milk? Yes. Well, that's his other servant, and I thought, okay, I'm going to have her be in the book, and I think I'll name her Annika. That seems a good name for her. Um, and then in when I read this biography, they said there's this other servant, and her name was Tanika. Tanika, right. I didn't even know the name <laughs> Tanika existed, but I was so close. <laughs> I just... And, and that those things really keep you, you know, make you just think, yes, this is the right thing. I'm, I'm on to the right. Uh, the, the muses right track. were speaking to you yeah. and channeling yeah. through you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, speaking of muses channeling artists and writers, I read that when you're writing your novels, which have been about a variety of different subjects, you like mm -hmm. to get really into the craft of what your characters are creating. And so I read that you t tried your hand at painting. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like? Did you try and paint? in the style of Vermeer, or were you just trying to put I, anything on the like canvas? Painting, I was painting in the style of a four-year-old, really. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, so uh, you're not going to be selling your art online anytime ooh, soon. No, it's <laughs> all thrown normalize. away, safely in the trash can. Um, I just felt I needed to uh, see what it was like to handle paint, to mix paint, um, to, to put the layers on the canvas, what was it like? I'd only ever painted, you know, in high school or whatever on, on paper, and I didn't know what canvas was like and what it would, you know, we, an acrylics and oil, you know, wouldn't have had acryl acrylics, so what, what does oil-based paint feel like? And mm -hmm. so I did all that, and I was absolutely dreadful at it. But it didn't matter because it gave me a real appreciation for what he did and also um, how... You know that just it made it easier for me to write about the process by going through it myself, even if I went through it at a very basic level. I think your descriptions of the mixing of pigments and the different kinds of pigments might be a revelation to people that paint didn't just come out of tubes. That part of the artistic process for for Vermeer was actually creating his own paint pigments, which really yeah. then tells the story of how he's creating this this piece of work. Every time that I've lectured about Vermeer or talked about this exhibition, I've been asked about the camera obscura, which figures quite prominently in your novel. And now we don't really know for sure if Vermeer used lenses or these kinds of optical devices, but you, you do have it as a part in your novel. And I wondered if, what's your instinct about Vermeer? Since you've seen, you're one of the few that's seen all of his paintings, do you think that he used the camera obscura? I think he did a little bit um, um, for various reasons. Uh, there are theories that go from he didn't use the camera obscura at all to uh, somebody saying he, not only did he use it, but he built an entire closet in one corner of his studio and placed in the wall of it a, a, a lens mm -hmm. to create like a whole room and he painted inside the camera obscura if that's possible. It seems so crazy. So I had to figure out where along that spectrum I wanted to place it, it, the camera obscura in my book. And my feeling is when you look at Vermeer's paintings in the order in which um, he painted them from early to late, and bearing in mind that a lot of them aren't dated, so there are sort of educated guesses taken as mm -hmm. to when they were, the, the order. But if you look at them, there's a, a change takes place um, after uh, there's an early painting. There are several early paintings that you, well, three early paintings you look at that just look like, to me, almost like anybody. They're sort of startup paintings. They were religious uh, scenes. They were okay. They're fine, but they're nothing special. And then, and then he does a more genre style painting called the Procurus. And mm -hmm. and then after that suddenly something happens. He becomes much more aware of perspective, much more aware of a kind of telescoping and 
intensifying of the focus of his eye on the subject so that um, more and more people end up in, in this one corner of his studio with a light coming from the left. And mm -hmm. he does a couple of paintings with men and women at a table and and then it just kind of, um, and there's something about the light and the the effects that he places, these kind of droplets of light um, that all look like he's looking at it from a diff for the different eyes, and I, I just thought there's such a to me such a marked difference between those early paintings and these, this this middle group that I, I thought something had to happen, and we know that the inventor of the microscope Van Leeuwenhoek uh, was this very uh, intellectual smart guy who lived very close to Vermeer. Um, and it was a small town, and mm -hmm. I just, it seemed to me so obvious that they would know each other, that mm -hmm. they would know each other, you know, Vermeer was all about looking, and to this, to have somebody right around the corner is also all looking, in, in, in focused on looking, it just seemed to me make, make sense that he would, if Van Leeuwenhoek we know had a camera obscure, we know he did, then surely he's going to show it to his friend, to this guy. So. To, to Vermeer, and so that was how I, I brought it in. It just seemed to make sense that, and it was great because it gave uh, it gave Vermeer and Greet an opportunity to 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 kind of bond over this looking experience because she knew that she was looking. I think her eyes open. I'm using all these eye puns, but her <laughs> eyes open to this to the the way of seeing a world, and I just needed a way for them to you know literally put their heads together to look. Mm -hmm under this cloak and look and and see more clearly. That's a very powerful moment for them because we do get the sense throughout the novel that Greet has this instinct that she's more sensitive to aesthetics than a normal woman of her age might have been or certainly a maid. So when she has this encounter with Vermeer, it's a very important moment for her in terms of her development and awakening and, and growing yes. up, really. And her interactions with the household. She's from a Protestant family. The Vermeer family is Catholic. So she doesn't totally fit in right away with his family. And we have a question from the audience that I'll incorporate into one of my own questions, which is about Vermeer's family, that are very interesting and we'd like to know that someone in the audience would like to know a little bit more about them. And specifically, I was really interested in the character of Maria Tins, who's Vermeer's mother-in-law. She is the person that really seems to understand his need to work very slowly the most. And I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what we know about the real Maria. Maria Tins was uh, a, a real the dynamo. I think she was a real bu businesswoman behind Vermeer, rather than Vermeer's wife. Um, I mean, when you think about it, Vermeer's wife was uh, Katerina, had eleven children plus four others who died. So uh, fifteen. She was busy. Yeah, <laughs> she was basically perpetually pregnant and, it's <laughs> and you were pregnant hard. yourself when you were writing the novels I right? was <laughs> pregnant myself so I really uh, I could really relate and you were really method writing <laughs> that's right um, I so I, I think that, you know Katerina's input would have been pretty limited she was she had her hands full with the household mm -hmm. and uh, but Maria Tins was known as to be a very canny businesswoman. She um, she owned a lot of paintings. She sold paintings, so she's known as an art dealer. Um, her marriage, uh, she had been married to um, you know Katerina's father. I can't remember his name, but he um, he apparently beat her, and that's she threw true. Him that's out. in your novel, but that's that's known to be true. Yeah, and she threw him out, um, wow. and uh, she also. Uh, was known, um, Vermeer got more and more into debt partly because of uh, having so many kids but and, and painting so slowly, um, but also they owned some property, Maria Tins owned some property and was a landlady and there was a war in the 1670s that created uh, fewer people were um, were speculating, or fewer people were buying paintings and fewer people were renting property, you know, or letting, renting property, so they had less money, and she set up a trust. I, I wasn't. I'm not really. I, my details of the of this are hazy because it was a That's long okay. time ago. I researched this, but <laughs> she set up the finances so that when Vermeer died, it was sudden. But when he died, 
the debt did not, the children did not inherit the debt. So the kids wow. did okay out of it, um, his kids. And that's a sign of somebody who's pretty forward thinking. Um, Very so savvy. She is quite a, yeah, yeah. And um, that's why I placed her in the book as the, as the sort of business person who's negotiating with the patron. Ben Riven, because right. you know you often get this with with creators, with artists. You have the agents, you know, and I have it. I'm a, I write books, and I have an agent, so I don't have to deal with all of the side of it of negotiating and things like that. And so it made sense to me that Maria Tins would would follow that that model. Mm. She'd, she'd play that part. And um, Vermeer's and, relation. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that elaborating on this theme of Vermeer's relationship with women, it's such an important part of his paintings. He typically doesn't paint a lot of men. Most of the subjects of his paintings are women. And in your novel, he's really the center point of this household full of women. And I wondered if you were thinking about any other of the paintings um, in his body of work when you were constructing some of those characters or thinking about the way that he interacts with women. Because there's almost a, a detachment in his his paintings uh, in some of them about the way that he's interacting as an artist, certainly not with the girl, but with some of the other women in his household. I was wondering if you were thinking about that when you constructed the characters. I think so. I think um, the paintings have a distance about them that um, may have been partly to do with him looking, looking at them through a camera obscura. I mean, when you use a camera obscura, you're not going to be there in there. I don't think you're not going to be under looking at it the whole time. But it does. It definitely places something very directly between you and your subject. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that he, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I think he kind of compartmentalized his world a little bit so that he could paint in this chaotic household. And I, I think that also goes to his relationships with the women, with the women of his household or the women that he's painting, would he would he would just detach himself slightly from them. Um, and uh, and that was to his individual relationships with people. Um, mm. uh, except for for greet, because to me this is a painting that is is more direct. So there's a more direct relationship between the painter and the model than there are and some of the others, partly because she's looking straight at us. Most right. of the, most of the other of his other paintings are of women doing something, some household activity like I don't know, reading a letter or um, weighing gold or putting on a necklace, and they're not looking at us. They're, they're looking out of the window or or at the letter down, and so, it's almost like Vermeer is catching them in the act of something that's really very private, right? Um, rather than being a, a part of it, so he's he's taking a back seat, and the right. difference with this one is that she's you know she's she's interacting with us. Well, um, speaking about interacting, I'll just make a quick note to our live audience here at the DeYoung. If you have any questions that you've written down on your comment cards and you'd like to pass them into the center of the aisle, we'd be happy to take those. And now back to interacting with you. Sure. <laughs> So um, we were talking about the relationships between Vermeer and the women in his life. What about his relationship with a potential patron? That's one of the theories about perhaps why he painted so slowly. We know that he did have this huge household full of children. It's mm. likely that he may have had one major patron. In your novel, you chose to make this patron sort of the villain and foil to uh, Vermeer. So could you tell us a little bit about what it was like to create the nasty Van Riefen. Well, you always have to have a villain in a piece, yes. although, you know, in a way you could say that Vermeer d doesn't treat Greet very well in the end. No. And, uh, and that's partly to do with this detachment from mm. his subject. You know, in the end, she is a subject of the painting, not a relationship with him. And right. that's where the tension, you know, the difficulty lies. But Van Riven is a more standard um, villain. I mean, but on the other hand, he he kind of underwrites the Vermeer household. He's always buying the paintings, and we, we do know he existed. And um, when he died, his son-in-law, I think, inherited quite a few of his Vermeers and ended up auctioning them off in 1696, I think. And that's partly how we know which ones uh, Van Riven had. And um, he he is very. I think he's important as a kind of a kind of the household is quite the book is quite 
enclosed within the household and mm -hmm. it's very important that you have somebody from the outside world come in. Um, you know, you get that also with uh, the butcher who's interested in Greet and also with Greet's family, but Van Riven is from the middle class and a wealthy class and he um, he owns the paintings and, you know, and Vermeer has this struggle to uh, to paint what he wants, you know, and I think it's like any artist who has a patron. It's it's do you or or even a you know a writer who has readers. Do you mm -hmm. write what your readers want to read, or do you do you say, well, actually, you got to trust me on this. I'm going to write something different, and mm -hmm. um, and I promise you, you're going to love it. But uh, but let me do my thing, and and so there is always that that pull Tension. that yeah, back and forth between. The patron who understandably is paying good money for a painting he sort of wants mm. you know he'll want something that he feels he can hang in his in his house but um, there comes he also has to learn to trust Vermeer and say you know do what you want so there's there's that kind of the commerce of painting of, mm -hmm. of, of creation of, of creativity the commerce behind that is part of, is a sort of sub theme that runs throughout the book well, listening to you speak about that artist-patron relationship, I was thinking a lot about um, what it must have been like for you as an author to watch your book and your characters come to life on the screen. And were you able to be really involved with the production of the film, or did you have to detach a little bit as it went into someone else's hands? I detached a bit, and that was, that was through my... I chose to detach myself. Um, you know, I was thrilled that it was that it, it was optioned and that they wanted to make a film. But I I was very aware that whatever I did, I was uh, you know however hard I tried to be part of it and tried to shape it, I was not going to be able to um, really have that much. They were never going to make the film that was in my head. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. So as a result, I thought, okay, um, to protect myself. I need to take a back seat mm. and step back from the project. Let the professionals get on with this. I don't know how to make a film, so let them do it. And um, and if I step back, it means if the film isn't any good, then I can say, <laughs> well, it was nothing to do with me. And uh, if the film is good, I can say, hooray, they made a great film of my book. So um, I took a back seat, but in a, you know, we got on very well. I got on well with the producer, with the um the screenwriter and uh, uh, they kept me posted, they kept me informed and then when they were filming I went and visited the set a couple of times because I really, um, I, I just wanted to see what it would be like and I had a great time watching them make this. It's such um, a rinse, richly nuanced film. I've watched it several times since I saw it before the exhibition opened and have watched it several times since and layering and layering upon detail in the rooms and all of these aspects that probably took many people thousands of hours to come up with and it all creates this rich visual tapestry that I think it's such a, a beautiful way to bring it all to life. But I mean I think what everybody really wants to know is what was it like meeting Colin Firth and having him <laughs> <laughs> ask you questions about playing Vermeer. I think maybe that's just me. I, I, I might be the only one that wants to know that. <laughs> I um very happy really nice oh, guy, oh. very bright and and he became kind of obsessed with Vermeer, and I thought that's good. You need to, that's what needs to happen. And mm -hmm. in fact, there was a point where um, uh, one of the highlights for me of visiting was I was in the cat the canteen on the set and uh, having a, something to eat, and uh, Colin Firth spotted me across the room, <laughs> and he came over, and uh, he. Um, Ah, Tracy, you're back. <laughs> I am. Yay. Okay, so you left us at this very climactic, exciting moment. You're in the canteen. You're about to have lunch. Colin Firth spots you. It's every woman's fantasy. What happens next? <laughs> I know. I was just sort of stretching it out by having a difficulty just to, you know, make you all excited. Um, uh, so he spotted me across the room and he made a beeline over and he said to the person sitting next to me, could, could you move so that I can sit next to Tracy? And I was like, oh, God. Um, I know it now. And he just wanted to talk to me about Vermeer and, and, uh, and 
you know, very lots of very specific questions and also just just to try to get the essence of Vermeer and uh, and I think I you know he had a very difficult role because uh, nobody really knows what Vermeer was like. The only way uh, in terms of his personality, um, we have no letters from or to him, very few descriptions of him, mm -hmm. and uh, all we have are his paintings to go on. And mm -hmm. to create a character out of those um, is very difficult. So I know you have a very special relationship with the girl, as we call her here in San Francisco, um, but was there any one of the paintings, since you are one of this rarefied club of people who's seen all of the paintings attributed to him, is there any one painting beyond, beyond her that really speaks to you or that surprised you the most when you saw it in person? Uh, the, there are two paintings, oh, well, a whole lot of paintings of, of his paintings I really love um, and I think one of probably my favorite painting outside of Girl with a Pearl Earring is called The Lace Maker in the Louvre. It's a really tiny, it's about that size and it's of a woman focusing on making lace um, like this and it's just beautifully, beautifully painted and what I particularly like is in the front of the painting is this box of, um, of thread that's used for making the lace that's spilling out over and there's this kind of you know everything else is really controlled but that particular bit of painting is kind of done a bit uh, it's hard to describe I don't have the word but it's done not slapdash but it's much looser brushwork mm -hmm. and it's rather like uh, the girl in the red hat at the at the National Gallery in Washington also mm -hmm. has some of that loose brushwork and it's wonderful to see that brushwork when you're used to Vermeer's intense control and to see right. him let go a little bit is just wow. Um, I also, uh, what surprised me is just how bad he could be at times, his painting. Sorry, I know I've said it now. I'm going to give all the no, oh, you, you. Yeah. <laughs> your paints badly, you know, but every painter has, Everybody you know, every has a bad day. <laughs> they definitely have bad days or bad weeks. Um, right. Towards the end of his life, uh, he he you know the, the the paintings I focus on are mostly from the middle period around Girl with the Pearl Earring in the 1660s, um, mm -hmm. 1670 onward. He's clearly in debt, and there are a couple of paintings. There's the Allegory of Faith, which mm -hmm. they 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 think was painted. I think it's at the Met in New York, and they they think it was painted as a commission for Jesuits and uh, Jesuit priests and it, uh, uh, you know when you paint by commission you have to do what they want and it just has its terrible painting. It's not that it's badly painted but the light is terrible, the subject matter is awful, it's really heavy handed, you know the one I'm talking about. It's, yeah, it's yeah. A, terrible to look at and you just think what has happened to him? Um, and I find some of his later paintings the light is is quite harsh. It's kind of a blue a blue light rather than a yellow light and I, I just don't like it as much. Um, mm. And there are certain the other thing is there's sometimes there's a painting recently that's been they've discovered is a, is a Vermeer. Everybody you know for years was it a Vermeer? It's a girl at, at the Virginals and you think is is a Vermeer or is it not? And they've pretty much established it was and it was sold at Sotheby's for a lot of money while back and um, if you look at her hands on the virginal they're really terribly done and a couple of his hands actually hands are very hard to paint hands and are very hard yes maybe that's why the girl is cut off at her yes. shoulders in that trony pose he didn't even didn't go there exactly but for sure there are things that he doesn't do well um, but then there are other even in paintings where some bits he doesn't do well he does other things he does exquisitely still right. so, you know, like he, the pearl in her I, I'm just struck every time that I look at it that it's essentially three brush strokes you have this teardrop shape on the left a little bit at the bottom of the pearl that's reflecting her collar and some space in between and when you step back from it your eye reads it as a pearl now we've yeah. had a question from the audience asking if you think that this is a real pearl or could it be some of the theories are that it could be Venetian glass imitation which would account for those beautiful reflections but do you think that Vermeer created it out of his imagination or do you think that this was really something he was looking at? I don't think he created out of his imagination. Um, I, I suspect, I mean there's been a theory that it's like a glass, little glass globe filled with silver 
fish scales. Mm. <laughs> How do they come up with these things? You know, it's like wow. A lot of time. <laughs> I'm just looking at it now, and I, I think it's historians. More, yeah, I, I think it probably is a pearl earring, but but mm. the way he's painted it is a kind of more suggestion of a of a of a point of light. Of mm. a, and and I don't think he minded that it doesn't look exactly like pearls. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other pearls in his paintings, and they really are pearls, particularly right. pearl necklaces. And I, I think that it's kind of going too far to try to make it into something else uh, right. other than... But I'm, I'm, no expert, I'm no expert in Dutch jewelry of the time, so <laughs> I suppose it could be something else. But I don't really care, because to me it looks like a pearl earring. A big one, but nonetheless yes. a big earring. <laughs> <laughs> so another question that we've had from Google Plus is about whether you would consider in the future writing about any other female artists like Artemisia Gentileschi, or I was wondering too if any of the other Vermeer paintings inspired you to write uh, another novel, or where are you going next with your work? You know, I, I, I write about things that inspire me, uh, and the inspiration sort of comes of a moment, and and it, I never am looking for an idea when it sort of leaps out at me. Of so, and I never where know where I'm gonna find that inspiration. But I never go looking for it specifically in a subject. So, you know, it, it makes sense that I might write a woman painter, but I've never found what nothing's ever leapt out at me. I've had various suggestions from people, but um, but nothing. You know, it has to. It, it's for different reasons rather than I'm going to repeat what I did before or do mm -hmm. the obvious thing. I never seem to do the obvious thing. And as for another Vermeer painting, no. I I, I think I've I've Closing done that book. Yeah, I think I need to leave that alone. Leave poor Vermeer alone. Um, he he's had enough attention and. Uh, uh, you know, and people after this book came out said, "Oh, are you going to write a sequel?" And I, we say, "Oh, what you want me to write? Woman with a pearl necklace now?" But I, <laughs> I just can't. I can't do that. I can't go down that path. Um, uh -huh. Just not how inspiration works for me. But I think, uh, you know, I think she's she's had enough attention. She'll be all right. <laughs> Is there some really obvious question about the book or your process that no one has ever asked you that you've been dying for 13 years to have the platform to talk about? Oh, have you been asked uh, everything? I've been asked pretty much everything, but you know, audiences always surprise me. So if there's any questions from the audience out there or on Twitter or whatever, that would be fantastic to see what people say. We have four minutes left, and one of the last questions that we had coming in was whether you have established any relationships with Vermeer scholars through your research and becoming a, a spokesperson for Vermeer. Well, you know, I, uh, I. <laughs> I was pretty terrified of Vermeer scholars when, <laughs> when I first came out with this book because for an art historian um, who's worked very hard on a subject for a long time, to have some young upstart come in who's not a, an art historian, not put in the time, it must be a little irritating. But actually, I think that um, I think most people... Uh, most of the art historians I've met, the Vermeer experts, are actually very happy with. They feel the book sits very well side by side with what they do. It's brought attention to Vermeer, and mm -hmm. that's fine with them. So, um, thankfully, I think it's been okay. And I, I have a very good relation with the Moritz House, where the uh, painting came from, uh, comes from. Um, Emily, the the director, and Fritz, who is the director before her. Um, they they've always been incredibly generous and kind uh, to me, and in fact, one of the best moments of my kind of Vermeer career um, was after the year, a few years after the book came out. Um, Fritz, the director at the time, asked me to come over and speak at a dinner for friends there, and my husband and I went, and um, they they asked us to come a bit early, an hour early, and and then Fritz, when I got there, Fritz said, go. She's yours. Go, go, uh, have a look. And you know, the, it was after hours, and they said they told the guards to leave us alone. So we just walked in, and just hung out with her in in the room for a while. And it was just great to see her quietly on on her own. And um, and that was a, a wonderful moment. And I find 
when I go in, when I'm in the room with her, it's very hard to leave. I don't know if at, at the exhibition you've noticed that, that people go and look at her and then they might leave the room and then they got to come back and mm -hmm. then her eyes follow you and you just, it's, it's really hard to leave because... You could do a sociological study on people moving in the gallery space and how they interact would, with her. I would love, you should ask the guards what, you know, they must see this all okay. day, um, that people just can't quite leave her because her eyes follow you and you look back and you just think, I can't leave her, I want to stay with her. And uh, it's, it's uh, so it was nice to be able to indulge that for that evening. It's, it's fabulous that you have had that experience and I, I feel the same way about seeing her in San Francisco and I think as an art historian I can say very honestly that you've done us all a great service because essentially what we do is to try and help fill in the stories for people about what these paintings meant, who they might have been, why should we care about art, why should we look at art and yes. in your novel and in your speaking about this painting you've just made people fall in love with her mm -hmm. and as if they hadn't already but they're really falling even deeper in love with her and and enhancing that sense that we really know her and you've given us that story which I think is such a beautiful and powerful thing as a storyteller so thank you as an art historian and I would like to thank everyone in the audience here today who's witnessed our conversation this conversation will live on in perpetuity on the internet I think you I can go to our website <laughs> <laughs> All those frozen moments where our faces are in awkward positions will be there for everyone to see forever. Sure will. Um, but hopefully they will enjoy it as much as we'll continue to enjoy The Girl with the Pearl airing here in San Francisco. So thank you to Tracy Chevalier. Thank you to our audience. Pleasure. A round of applause. Thank you. And now I think we'll sign off. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>